We never see an ancient dance of give and take from B to B. Thousands all born from one royal mother singing secret songs to each other. It's a symphony of wings in a thousand different keys. Mysterious and wonderful, the secret life of bees. She's there when they depart up to meet the sunlight as the day's about to start b after b beside his brother lifted by the wings of one another gather nectar bring it home make the honey fill the comb do your work die in grace it has a rhythm The secret life of beings And no matter where they fly Or what sorrow they must bear What sustains them will never die The mother is always there In a symphony of wings In a thousand different keys Mysterious and Secret life of bees. Hi, before our, uh, the next song, I thought I would just give you guys a little context for the songs you're hearing tonight in case some of you don't know the book. The, well, the song you just heard, um, August sings to Lily Owens, who's a, um, a, teen, a white teenager who flees her abusive father and winds up being taken in at a bee farm, the home of three African-American sisters. And that, that song um, comes when, when August teaches Lily about beekeeping. The other, there's also a young man who, who tends the bees who Lily meets, and the next song is uh, a love song that, that they, they sing as they've been working on the bee farm together. That's right. What do I love? Let's see. <laughs> I'm waiting. I love, I mean, I really love the color red. You do. I love to stay up way too late and read in bed. Me too. I love the rain on my skin When I'm sticky and hot I love the smell of old books A little weird, but why not? I love the dew on my ankles Morning glories The moon through the trees And I love What? The way you Talk to bees. Did you know that in one of the uh, Eskimo languages there are 32 names for love? That's a lot of loving. 
And uh, what about you? I love the sound of muddy waters rocking his guitar. Who? <laughs> and every piston, wheel, and spark plug of my car. Of course you do. I love an icy cold Coke when I'm thirsty as hell. I love the smell of cut grass. <laughs> God, I can't stomach that smell. I love the feel of a football. I've caught me a few, and I love what? Working here with you, working with you. I love working with you, working with you. that breeze I love that sky I love the radio so do I <laughs> and I love honey I love it too do you love the bee yes I Oh my Lord, that sun is so bright. Here, let me carry that. No worries, it's light. Well, all right. Well, all right. So I'll just I'll just um, uh, set up the next song. So so the show takes place in the summer of 1964 in a small town in South Carolina. And this is shortly after the Civil Rights Act is passed, and um, there's a lot of violence uh, as the provisions of that law are being tested. And Lily and and Zach um, uh, sort of sneak away together and take a, a ride into town in his Ford Fairlane, and the police pull them over and wind up uh, beating Zach and he's in, in jail, and this song takes place after he's uh, released on bail and comes back to uh, the Boatwright's house. The world already told us what they're gonna do to me If I so much as try to hold your hand you know how much I want to be as close as we can be but that's not happening not as matters stand can't change the world with the hope and a kiss but it's a way to begin you want a world that is better than this that make them imagine what's never been we can't change their minds with the wish and a prayer. It's what we know going in. We've got to stand for what is righteous and fair. Make them imagine what's never been. Think what if, think why not. So that what you want becomes what you've got. Drive the fear from your heart. Insist on the impossible. Then stand back and watch the Red Sea part. Can't change the world, says the powers that be. 
I say that notion wears thin It may take years Like a lifetime or three But make them imagine what's never been There is no guarantee It's a long hard road and the trip ain't free But have faith like you say Insist on the impossible And the walls will tumble down one day High in the sky, hey, I promise it's not. Girl, I am certain as in. If you and I just keep stirring the pot, we're, we're gonna, gonna keep, keep getting, getting under, under their, their skin. skin. Then who knows? You and me, if the time were right, which it's gonna be. Fingers crossed, that makes two. Insist on the impossible. And there's nothing that we cannot do Can't change the world with a speech or a song But we can give it a spin And if the world doesn't hurry along Give it a good healthy kick in the shin And make them imagine We'll make them imagine What's never been? All right. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. I'm Whitney. I'll be moderating the discussion with the wonderful creatives behind this new musical. Can you guys just introduce yourselves to everyone really quickly? Uh, I'm Duncan Sheik, the composer. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lynn Nottage, the book writer. And I'm Susan Birkenhead. I wrote the lyrics. Sam Gold, director. Thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about how this all came to be. How long have you guys been collaborating on this and working on it? Um, um, so we've I, been working on it for about five years, but yeah. Susan really knows the origin story. Um, I had a phone call from my agent one day who said, I just read this wonderful book and I think it would make a great musical and I think it would be great for you, and can I send it to you? And he sent me the book, I read it, and immediately called him back and said yes. And he said, who do you want to write the book? And I said, you're not gonna love this because she's not William Morris Endeavor, <laughs> she's CAA. And he said, who is it? I said, Lynn Nottage is a friend of mine. He said, done, done. And then we, uh, we were on board and then I think he said, well, he said, who do you want to write the music? And we said, Duncan Sheik. And I said, guess what? He's also CAA. And, and, and we share an agent. Not, <laughs> they share an agent. Not only that, but Sue Monk Kidd was thrilled because she said, he grew up in South Carolina and I love his music. So that was it. And, um, and then Sam came on you guys had already been working on the show yeah. for a while before before the director came on, which is fairly sort of typical of the process. The writers get going, and then there becomes a point where it seems like having an extra eye would be good. And so I joined, and we started putting things on our feet for workshops, which we've done sort of annually for five years, kind of <laughs> get together and work on the material, and the material grows over the course of the process, which is a very good way to make a show, to all be in the room together over a long period of time and let it kind of organically grow. Yeah. The great thing was that the very first time we got together, um, Lynn had, I think it was your idea, to um, pick out the emotional highlights in the book. And then we got together and we presented our lists and it was almost exactly the same list with maybe right. one exception or two exceptions. And then we were off and running. That's amazing. You, you're kind of like taking me my next question, but Lynn, will you just talk to us a little bit more about 
how you kind of took on this endeavor, how you think about turning uh, a piece of literature, a novel, into a theatrical experience? Um, sure, I'm primarily a playwright, and for a long time I avoided writing a musical, and I don't know why, because my life began in musical theater. I was a pianist, and the way I came to theater was through composition, and then spent the rest of my professional life trying to avoid writing a musical. And so, <laughs> Um, when I was approached about um, doing Secret Life of Bees, I immediately said yes because I had read the book years ago and I loved it. And then I reread it and I remembered all of the reasons that I loved the book. But I'm someone who's never done an adaptation and I'm relatively new to the musical theater form, so I definitely approached this process as a student. And I was really fortunate to have collaborators like Duncan and Susan who, and, and Sam, all who have spent time um, in the trenches conjuring um, musicals and so I really leaned on them for their expertise and tried to figure out how to do this so it's, it's been this wonderful process of discovery and learning how to write a musical while writing a musical and I think in some ways that works because I don't know the mistakes. Mm -hmm. Um, I just know the story that I want to tell and one of the things that Susan said is um, I was in the midst of this process she said you are the guardian of the narrative mm -hmm. and once she said that it made it really easy for me because I thought that's what I am I'm there to protect the integrity of the characters and make sure that no matter what the audience always understands and follows the story and in terms of doing an adaptation, one of the challenges is that I really did respond and love this book. And when I first did the first draft, the script was almost an exact replica mm -hmm. of the book, which didn't work. And there's reasons why that um, um, book didn't work on, on stage. And so I think the process of adaptation was really whittling down and trying to figure out where is the dramatic story and what's the essence and the core of the narrative that we want to tell. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, so just to piggyback on that, I, I, you know, I remember sort of the first workshop where we were all working together, and um, I had just, uh, I think, closed American Psycho, which was like sort of a, a disaster for me. And then, <laughs> and everyone, <laughs> you know, and we, everyone showed up in the room, and then Lynn gave me this like 250 page <laughs> script that I had never seen before. And they were like, okay, write some songs. <laughs> it's true, the first draft was impossibly long. So, so yeah. but, 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 you know, the truth is like, you know, I, I knew Susan um, actually through her son, because we had been friends for, for decades, actually. And, and I, I knew Lynn more by reputation. We both went to Brown together and I loved her work. And Sam I had been trying to work with for six or seven or eight years. I tried to get him to work on a version of L'Etranger with me, which he didn't want to do, <laughs> probably <laughs> wisely. Um, <clears throat> but so the, te the team was so great that I was just like, okay, I, I've got to do this no matter, no matter what the yeah. obstacles. What was the first song you guys wrote? I'm trying to remember now. I think the first one was Sign My Name, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. That was in the first yeah. set, yeah. 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 Which is sort of the moment that kicks off the story when Rosaline goes to try to register. Um, and also I think Secret Life of Bees came very early very on that we way. decided that that was important for us to nail that song early. Well, it's really amazing. I've gotten, I've had the opportunity to see them kind of develop this over the years. Will you just talk to the audience a little bit about how you guys come up with these moments? Because sometimes the song's there, like you said, you wrote that song, or sometimes Susan will write lyrics, and the alchemy is really fascinating. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, it really depends on the composer you're working with. Duncan is one of those composers who likes to have a lyric in place, um, which is you know, it's great for me. <laughs> but it's um, a challenge, sometimes. <laughs> but sometimes it's a, it's a challenge for me. You know, it, it, it depends. Um, but the song really comes out of the moment. Mm -hmm. It depends on the moment. And we all discuss the moment. And what are the emotional needs of the moment? What does the song have to accomplish, actually? And... Um, 
When I teach master classes, I always say to the students, a song is really like an acting exercise. You have to know the intention of the song. You have to crawl into the character's head and you have to speak as the character, sing as the character. Um, I also depend on the book writer, not only for the structure of the whole piece, but for the character's voice, because the voice that Lynn is writing has to be the same voice that I'm writing. It, it sort of has which, to be, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which is a really interesting process for us that as we're developing the piece, I think that Susan and I probably spoke on the phone at least four or five times a day for almost five years. Yes. <laughs> and so we've really gotten to know each other very well. But I, right. I remember Susan saying to me early on in the process is like, before I even write any lyrics, why don't you write the scene as if you're writing it um, a play? And um, write a monologue where you think the song is going to be, and that's what I did. And then she would beautifully lift that monologue and turn it into this, this, this lovely song that worked much better than my monologue. Well, it's because, it, you know, it has to be a sort of fluid thing so that you can't tell um, where the dialogue leaves off and the song begins. It has to be the same voice. And I remember that Susan used to get really angry um, at me because I was a student in that I would, <laughs> I would replicate everything in the song in the okay. script just in case people didn't understand. <laughs> and she's like, you're, you're trying to do my job. <laughs> Well, there has been a sort of constant negotiation in terms of the, the songwriting itself between like being literal, being specific, oh, yes. and being universal. And, and these, these three sort of, you know, to what degree do you have these ingredients in the soup? And it's really tricky because, you know, if you're too literal, it's just, it's annoying. If you're too specific, it's kind of, you know, it's also annoying. And if you're universal, it can just be sort of vague and, and, and doesn't help tell the story. So we're, 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 we're trying to figure out how to make these three elements right. sort of work together. Yeah. Sam, will you talk to us a little bit about direction? We're like, you guys are about three weeks into rehearsals right now already. Um, maybe will you talk to us about your staging process or what's inspiring you most about the story right now? Yeah, so five years later, there's a, there's a script in rehearsal um, and we're, yeah, we're halfway through the rehearsal process of the production. So, um, so the, the, the writing team is still really in the thick of, of writing the show. It, if it takes five years to get to first rehearsal, it's still, you know, not done yet. And, and there's, there's a lot of work it, it's kind of amazing to think how it ever feels finished, you know, the, their process going back and forth and around. And in the meantime, this is, you're sort of catching us right when um, I'm putting the show up on its feet. And then um, the day after tomorrow, the writers will see a kind of rough staging to kind of respond to and think about where the, where the, the work is headed. So it's a really... It's a fun time in the, in the process after five years of talking and five phone calls a day with Lynn and Susan. Now there's something in a room with a full cast and we're on our way to an audience um, seeing the whole show. Um, the, 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 it, the thing that, uh, about their, their conception and writing of this piece that really excited me is um, when, when I was giving you the the simplest version of the plot of the show I could possibly do between songs, but the, one of the main ideas in the book or really inspiring aspects of the book is that Lily shows up at the Boatwright's house and the, the Boatwrights, uh, they, um, they, they pray to a black Madonna. They have a, um, a driftwood carving of uh, um, a woman that inspires a... Um, uh, a spiritual practice that they um, they practice in their living room, and people from the community come over every Sunday, and they have this spiritual practice that they've that's sort of been passed down for generations in their home, and that aspect of the the story and the lives of the characters um, was very inspiring to me because I think uh, a lot about making plays like a kind of spiritual ritual. I, I always think about 
ritual and religion and temples and churches and things as I'm making, as I'm staging work. And, and there's a very, very potent to me staging metaphor in the show where, um, where this group of women comes together to, to, to pray together in their living room. So the staging of the show is, is very inspired by that kind of homemade religious practice that's within the story. And hopefully the production of the, of the musical will, will feel a bit like that, like we're inviting the audience in to, um, to participate or, or witness this, this kind of homemade spiritual event that is the show. Thank you. Duncan, it's really cool. You're actually, you grew up in the region in which the story kind of takes place. So it's, it's been very, very cool seeing how you've been orchestrating all of this. Will you talk to us a little bit about the instrumentation and sounds of the Gullah Islands? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I grew up in Hilton Head Island, which um, uh, was actually home to some Gullah and Geechee communities, but uh, actually next to Hilton Head was Defusky Island, which was home to like a sort of very vibrant Gullah and Geechee community, and it was some place that we would travel to as kids. You know, when I was in my sort of preteens and and in my early adolescence, and you know, again, it was it, it was in fact a sort of very segregated scenario where you sort of had the you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but you had the sort of like rich white people who had big houses on Hilton Head and then you had the sort of Gullah and Geechee communities separate from that. But I do feel like there was an energy that suffused the area that I sort of took in and I, and I really feel strongly about it and I feel like it really influenced my work in some way. Um, and, you know, in some inchoate, mysterious way I feel like it's come out in certain songs and that's been like a really beautiful experience for me to sort of come full circle to my childhood. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Is there anything else you guys would like us to know about the project? Is there anything else you'd like to talk to us about the project? That's it. That was my last about, question. About the project, the piece. <laughs> about, about the project. Oh. Uh, yeah. Me personally, yeah, <laughs> or just the group. Anyone. Well, okay, so yeah, I can say I can say a couple other things. I mean, so yeah. you know, it's been interesting because as a composer, you, you you try and have your own voice in every show that you do, um, but there are sort of genre specific things that you frameworks that you need to work within. And in this particular show, there's sort of three genres that are um, very clearly sort of became apparent as we continued to work on it. One of which was, for lack of a better word, sort of grassroots Americana, you know, kind of, you know, early 60s white people music. And then sort of, um, you know, R&B, uh, the early R&B sort of mid 60s, you know, um, stuff that African American people would have been listening to. And then the third um, part is this sort of, again, this sort of mysterious, syncretic uh, music that was coming from, from these women where it was sort of notionally Christian on top, and yet underneath there was this sort of Yoruba sensibility and sort of, you know, African spirituality underneath it. Um, and, and so that was, you know, sort of discovering that was um, a really, really cool part of the process for me. And Chris, our choreographer, we had lots of conversations about it, and he's much more educated about this stuff than I am. But um, it was really great to kind of like learn more about, you know, how those two things intersected. Um, and I probably Lynn could say. No, I mean it's, it's really more. interesting hearing you speak because I do remember when we're all sitting in a room and that moment of discovery when we yeah. um, felt like we can't make a traditional musical 
theater piece about um, this, this period of time because there was a, a musical tension that existed between sort of traditional folksy bluegrass white music and um, R&B which was emerging in a really popular way and also the this, this spiritual, as you say, Yoruba based music that's from the Gullah Sea Islands and so we thought how do we create a musical that that seamlessly incorporates all of those textures and all of those elements, which I think took us some time to arrive at yeah. and, and trial and error. Well, I remember when um, I wrote what we used to call Obadiah's Tale, Our Lady of Chains, and sent it to Duncan. And he immediately came up with this incredible gullah feel to the music. And everything broke open at that point. Yeah, I think and that's that true. And that really enabled us to do yeah. the rest of the stuff for the Daughters of Mary. You know, it's, it, it is. It's an extraordinarily yeah. beautiful song. And once we heard it, it very much feels like it's the core of the music and not, not musical, not, not just sonically, but ritually as well. And I think it's really when you suddenly said, oh my God, I think this is basically a tale told by the Daughters of Mary. Yeah, it's so hard you, when you're adapting a book and you have strong source material that people, the audience is already attached to and you approach trying to adapt it, you, um, you, it's hard to see the difference between what you're in love with about the form of the original and how to birth the form of your piece of art because you have to give birth to your own work. It's, it, it isn't going to stand in relationship to the book. Um, it has to be its own, it has to have its own internal engine. And I really feel like, you know, like all four of us in our own way kind of came to what that engine would be right. having to do with the, um, the kind of multi-layered history that led these women to pray to the Black Madonna, that, that the, the kind of, the, the, once we started looking at uh, Gullah Geechee culture and thinking about the history of those women and, 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 what, and, and what they were expressing, um, it started to feel like a, a piece of theater as opposed to a book on stage. And you can, get, you can take the plot of the book that's very moving to you and try to put it on stage, but it, doesn't, it sort of doesn't take life as a, as a piece of theater until you find something more more theatrical as an organizing principle and and there is there's theater to to that as an organizing principle and we we kind of got off and running as we all discovered yeah. that yeah well thank you so much you guys thank you for spending time with us and thank you all for being here come check out the show and there will be a little reception afterwards mm -hmm. thank you all thank, thank you, you.